Hello and welcome. In the previous video, I gave you a new graphical organizer for applying the extended Euclidean algorithm, one which I haven't been able to find anywhere in the literature. And so that algorithm I gave you probably looks, well, it shouldn't be difficult, but mystifying as to why it's true. So this video, we're going to actually give a proof of that result. Uh, in order to write down a proof, of course, I need to write down a theorem. In order to write down a theorem, I should probably set up some notation so we understand what it is we're, we're getting at. So first, uh, we start with a couple of integers. When we're applying the Euclidean algorithm, of course, one of them shouldn't be zero. And then we start applying the division algorithm, and we see, okay, well, A can be written as some quotient times B plus a remainder. And of course, the remainder is going to be non-negative and less than b, but we won't need that in this proof. Uh, then I slide the two remainders over. So b then becomes some q2 times r1 plus another remainder. And I repeat, slide the r1 over, slide the r2 over, I get a new quotient and a new remainder. And I keep doing this. And at some point, I'm going to stop with, say, an nth remainder and an nth quotient. And you, know, you can see the, the nth quotient will correspond to the n minus first remainder. And this will all correspond to the n minus second remainder. All right, and when you terminate, of course, this is supposed to be the GCD of A and B. Now, one thing you might be a little dissatisfied with is that you have all these remainders and then there's just A and B just sticking out like a sore thumb. So to make the terminology or the notation a little bit easier, we're just going to relabel A and B as remainders themselves. So B, that comes before R1, so that will be labeled as R0. A coming before R0 will become R negative 1. Okay, so it's just a way of, of getting rid of these specific uh, letters A and B. So we'll just replace those in here. It makes it a little easier to keep track of things without having to pull off A and B as special cases. All right, next. The previous video told you to take all of the quotients and you're going to write them down in reverse order, starting from the bottom, with a negation in front. So we keep doing that, right? We get negative Q2, negative Q1. Right. Then we start with a 1 underneath the negative qn. And the rule is you're supposed to multiply up and then add the digit to the left. Of course, there is no digit to the left here. So we always will just get negative qn in this next component. Now the next one actually has something to do. We have to multiply and add the 1. Of course, the negatives will cancel and we get qn times qn minus 1 plus 1, and we, we keep going. Uh, and I don't want to write out any more terms because they start to get very complicated. In fact, part of the whole reason we want to use this graphical organizer is to avoid sort of long expressions and, and long calculations. Uh, so instead, I want to uh, define what the next term is recursively. So let me give names to these positions. So this could be c sub n, just corresponding with the q sub n. And this will be cn minus 1 and cn minus 2. And we keep going. Uh, this one down here will be c sub 2, c sub 1. And of course, we always finish with one extra. We can multiply c1 by negative q1 and add c2. And that will give us one extra term, c0. OK. Uh, so the what is the recursion uh, relation between these? Well. Let's write down what the kth term should be. Well, the first two we, we always can write down. So if k is equal to n, it's just going to always equal 1. And if k is equal to n minus 1, then the ck is going to equal negative q sub n. All right, so the question is, is what happens if I choose a, uh, a k which is not n or n minus 1? So in that case, I'm going to take, well, there's going to be this term to the left. That'll be c sub k plus 2, right? So to get the n minus 2 term, I end up adding the cn term at the end. So that's what this is. And then I'm going to do 
Well, there's going to be a minus sign, we know that, coming from multiplying uh, this top quotient. So I'll do minus q sub k plus 1 times c sub k plus 1. All right, so you'll take the k plus 1 c, that's from the bottom row, multiply by the quotient above, which will be a negative of q k plus 1, and then you add the constant to the left. So this is what we get for all the k's, uh, which are going to be between uh, 0 and n minus 2. So 0, 1, all the way through n minus 2. We already have the n minus 1 and the n up above. So this is how we can define it. This is why we, we want to start with two different uh, assumptions. That way we can define this uh, recursively in terms of two different terms in the series. Okay, and so now what is the claim? All right, and this is actually going to be the theorem now. So the theorem is that for all of the um, uh, all of these remainder pairs that we get, so r negative one and r zero, r zero and one, r one and r two, all the way down to r n minus two and r n minus one, that we can write the GCD, which we know is the r n, as a combination of these two remainders, where to get the coefficients for that combination, you just take the corresponding pair of C's, right? which will end here when you have R0, R negative 1. You'll be using the C0 and the C positive 1. So the theorem is that if you have some L between negative 1 and n minus 2, okay, so we finish with this R n minus 2 term, then The GCD of A and B, which is R sub n, is going to equal the L plus tooth term in the C sequence times R sub L plus the L plus first term in the sequence times R sub L plus 1, the L plus first remainder. Okay, And just to see why the indices look out uh, work the way they do, you look at the top, for example, you want to write R negative 1 and r0, and what are the coefficients? Well, for r negative 1, you use c sub 1, and the index is 2 more than negative 1. And for c sub 0, that corresponds to r sub 0, though there you have the same index. So down here, you can see for the first r, we use a c which has two greater index, right? 1 versus negative 1. And for the second one, they have the same index. Okay. All right, so let's go about trying to prove this theorem. So the first observation we make is that in the Euclidean algorithm, we can go to the last line, and we know that Rn minus 2 is Q sub n times Rn minus 1 plus R sub n. So if we solve for R sub n, we'll get Rn minus 2 minus, well, the rest of this stuff, Q sub n times r n minus 1. OK, so we need to handle all of these cases, but let's start with the n minus 2 case and work our way down. So when l is equal to n minus 2, we want to show this relationship. OK, but what do we have when, when l is equal to n minus 2? Well, let's look at this right-hand side. So we have C, and now we're going to have n minus 2 plus 2, R n minus 2, plus C, okay, now the L is n minus 2, so we get n minus 2 plus 1, R n minus 2 plus 1. All right, so n minus 2 plus 2, that's just going to be C sub n, R n minus 2, and then here we're going to have C sub n minus 1, and then r n minus 1. Now c sub n and c sub n minus 1, those are given explicitly. c sub n is 1, and c sub n minus 1 is negative q sub n. So we can rewrite this just as r n minus 2 plus negative q n times r n minus 1. Oh, but hey, look what we have just above. <laughs> 
R sub N is equal to R N minus two plus negative Q sub N R N minus one. So this is equal to R sub N. All right, so the theorem is true in the special case where L is equal to N minus two. And this is gonna essentially work as a base case for us. So what we're gonna do now is assume that we've shown it uh, for, um, for some L and we're gonna make sure that it's actually gonna work for L minus one. Okay, so let's scroll down a little bit. So let's assume the result is true. for some L, well, greater than negative one. All right, because we're gonna to wanna to go down by one. Of course, if we're starting at negative one, that's not gonna work. So we assume it's true for some L greater than one, uh, negative one rather. So we have this result. Let's, uh, maybe we'll copy this down so we can see it. So we'll copy this down here. Oops, move that over. Yoink. Okay, so we're going to assume that the result is true uh, for a particular L. And now we want to show that it works for L minus 1. So show result holds for L minus 1. Okay, well, what do we know? about L minus one, well, from the Euclidean algorithm, we know that R L minus one is the L plus first quotient times R sub L plus the L plus first remainder. Okay. So if I replace my L's with L minus ones in here, then I get, well, let's see here, thus, Okay, let's start with C. If I decrease L by one, I'll get C L plus one, and then I'll get R L minus one, plus, now this will become C sub L, R sub L. And the R L minus one, we, we just said we can replace it now with this division algorithm uh, replacement. So we have C L plus one times QL plus one times RL plus RL plus one. Plus, okay, now I have this C sub L and we have a recurrence relation for C sub L. We know what C sub L is going to equal. This is going to equal C L sub two minus QL sub one times C L sub one. So this is where you multiply the previous term times the quotient and then add the double previous term. And that'll all be multiplied by R sub L. Okay, well we have a, a couple of R sub L's here. So let's distribute and rearrange so that we, we get all the R sub L's. So let's see, um, I have a C sub L plus one times Q sub L sub one times an RL. Uh, I also have a C L sub L plus two and then I also have a minus, uh, and let me rearrange the order of this just slightly, make the C first, so C L plus one times Q L plus one. Okay, and all those get multiplied by R sub L. And what's left over? Well, let's see, ah, I have a C L plus one times R L plus one. So C L plus one times R L plus one. Ah, but notice, this first sum end and this last sum end are opposites of each other. So in fact, I end up with CL plus two times R sub L plus CL plus one times RL plus one. And this is precisely what we knew by assuming that the result held for some L. And so this is equal to R sub N. And so in a sort of inductive proof here, we're able to show that this is going to hold for all of these uh, L's all the way down to negative one, right? So assuming L is greater than negative one means it could be as small as zero. And when it does equal zero, we see the result will hold for negative one. All right, so this completes the proof. 
and shows that that, that really interesting approach to using the extended Euclidean algorithm actually works. How crazy.